And welcome to another edition of the Media Twits. I'm Mark Glazer, Executive Editor of PBS Media Shift. Uh, this week we'll be talking about the Riptide report from the Shorenstein Center, looking back at the digital Riptide and how it affected the news business um, and with digital disruption, and also some criticism of the report around diversity among the interview subjects. We'll also be talking about uh, programmers um, and the fall of the Business Insider CTO, Pax Dickinson, over some incredibly misogynist, sexist, racist, you name it, uh, Twitter feed, and also um, the tit stare uh, pre presentation that happened at TechCrunch Disrupt. A lot of interesting things to talk about this Friday the 13th, and our panel includes Anna Marie Cox from The Guardian, uh, Andrea Peterson from The Washington Post, Andrew Lee from American University, Paul Sagan from Akamai, Shorenstein Center Fellow, who was a co-author of the Riptide Report. Um, so first, let's talk about that Riptide Report. Um, it's a pretty incredibly exhaustive, um, comprehensive, in-depth, you name it. It's a huge report uh, talking to some real big key players from the past, including Steve Case from AOL, Eric Schmidt from Google, Dick Costolo from Twitter now. Um, so it's an incredibly comprehensive look back. Um, Paul, tell us a little bit about what you were trying to accomplish with the report. Um, you know, it obviously has a big historical perspective to it. Um, what, what do you feel like kind of was the point behind the report and what did you guys get out of it? Sure, thanks. I appreciate being here today on, on behalf of uh, John Huey and, and Martin Eisenholtz as well. We appreciate the interest in, in Riptide and being able to talk about what we were trying to accomplish, maybe what we weren't trying to accomplish, and where uh, there's room to do more things uh, with the idea in the future. The three of us wound up as fellows at the Shorenstein Center at the Kennedy School at Harvard uh, this winter, um, where usually the definition of what you're going to work on is pretty loose till you get there. Most people write a white paper, and the three of us got there and said, we didn't really want to write something that was static. Uh, we were all at interesting turning points in our career, having worked in the news business uh, one way or another for a very long time. And frankly, we we're kind of interested in what happened to the business that we cared a lot about, the business of journalism, particularly in the U.S., which is where we focused our look. And we realized we didn't even necessarily agree on all the things we all thought we had lived through. So we hit on this idea of why don't we go out and research it and try to understand that. We thought originally maybe we'll interview 10 or 20 people, talk about five to 10 sort of seminal events, post them almost as bullet points with some thoughts and say, you know, have at it or where does this go from here. And as we got in it, we realized there were more and more events, more and more people to talk to, and frankly covered a lot more ground in just 90 days or approximately 90 days than we ever expected. We also thought that the story really went back over 30 years to the earliest digital experiments that many print organizations and telecommunications companies worked on way before the proprietary online services and the web came along. You needed to go back that far to tell the story to understand, we thought, what happened. And we really approached it as not a, a look at just journalism, but really the story, a business story about the changing business models of journalism in the news business. And we started with a basic concern that it's been very well documented, the rapid decline of the old media companies and news companies, uh, turmoil amongst their ranks, loss of jobs uh, and shrinking circulation, replaced by new organizations. Some we'd probably easily agree are news organizations. Some there's a lot of room for debate. And many we'd say really aren't at all. And we, we certainly had personally experienced, and there's been a lot written about the concern about who's going to do accountability journalism, both on the local level and on the national and international scale? And what would be the entities that would provide uh, that kind of check and balance, and how would they be supported? So we wanted to look at it from a business point of view. And so we started interviewing people, and our real premise was we needed to look at the major institutions that, and what organizations replaced them, and we would talk to the people who made had the power to make the biggest decisions there. And it led us to scores of people. There are some we didn't get to, some we wanted to and ran out of time. Others we asked and they simply weren't available. One or two said, I don't want to do it. But mostly it was a question of we got to them and could schedule them or they weren't available. 
And we also you, thought you, you that rather than make it a, I'm let me sorry. Make one, one last Go point. Ahead. Rather than make it a static report, we knew the story wasn't done and we hadn't covered it all, even the pieces we focused on. We put it up as a piece of web journalism. So our essay is there and it's over 100 pages. But the entire interviews with 60 some people are there. They're transcripts, so they're easier to search through. Um, and there are ways to comment on it uh, and build on it. And the Shorenstein Center um, also thought of it as a beginning, not an end, that could be added on to over time. And I know one of the things they're looking at is how do they bring in additional fellows who can continue to do the reporting, uh, either on areas that we missed perhaps or just couldn't get to, or on how the story continues to unfold uh, going forward. So we consider it, although it's pretty massive, you, you, you'd have to give it 60 or 70 hours today to go through all the content that's there, uh, that it's a work in progress and, and we hope more follows. And so you said something about, I remember in looking at part of the report that you were surprised. You felt, um, you know, there were a lot of surprises, um, although some of us have, have kind of read some of these stories before and, you know, had known it just as people who are in kind of the media world. What, what were your biggest surprise out of everything you found? So I think there were a couple, and you're right, some of them were... Um, not surprises, but when you pulled them together, they seemed to be a surprise. One was, I think, how early a lot of these entities, the news entities, um, actually identified the change and the risk of change, way pre-web, even pre-online services, and the opportunity, and started to take action. And it's, it's almost ironic that some of those that saw it and said there were risks early were some of the earliest to lose, like Knight Ritter, that doesn't uh, even exist anymore tried hard by the scale of their businesses and what they would invest in something new, spent fortunes. Now, you know, there's, there's one, one comment that uh, Knight Ritter was spending a million dollars a year at their peak on their lab uh, out in Colorado, where they actually built a prototype of what we would identify as an iPad way before Apple introduced it. I wasn't quite this uh, uh, flip in the, in the essay, but you know, I did say in, in one other forum, a million dollars a year isn't the sushi budget probably in the, in the Apple cafeteria. They simply couldn't keep up uh, with, with what happened. So I think we were surprised at how early some entities tried. So it wasn't that they missed it or were stupid about it. I think one thing that we really focused on was this concept of original sin. Uh, me, people have often said, well, the, the, the original sin was all the news organizations that gave content away for free. If we'd all just been patient, including some of the decisions I was involved with at, at Time Inc. in the early days of the web and Pathfinder and just waited, um, the business model today would be better. And we looked at some decisions, particularly at Reuters and Yahoo, who had different models and they gave all that content away for free. So our conclusion was it wasn't a question of original sin. The decision couldn't have been made differently and a lot of people we talked to about that. And another, which was something we were aware of, and last point I'll make, I know other people want to talk, was just how few engineers there were. And the winning disruptors, large and even small, are often those entities that have large numbers of engineers, and more often than not, pick if you look at Google or Twitter or others, the engineers aren't just large in number, they're in charge. And it's frankly, most of the media companies, certainly the large ones then, and even the ones who are fairly large today, don't have a lot of engineers, and it would have been inconceivable to turn over the keys, if you will, to engineers. They just couldn't do it. There was no mechanism uh, to get that done, and they simply couldn't keep up. There's, I can get to it later, but there's an interesting anecdote about one of the reasons CNN succeeded really well early on and fell off the pace because they went from having a few engineers in charge to you know, the, the permanent government taking over after time, if you will. What about this, uh, Matthew Ingram had a really interesting critique saying, you know, you use this riptide metaphor mm -hmm. that, you know, the digital disruption happened and, and no one could, you know, deal with it. It was, you know, kind of, there's no blame because no one could really do anything about it. And, you know, so no one is to blame. I mean, do you feel like that's a fair critique? I mean, you being involved in what you were involved with, uh, with Pathfinder and all these things, I mean, should you take some of the blame? You know, I, I don't think blame is a useful term, and he uses it, so uh, let's, let's talk to it. I don't think it was a question of, we weren't trying to assess penalties. 
or blame anybody. We're simply trying to explain what happened and see if it could illuminate some thoughts going forward for people. So I think it's a question of blame. I think one of the things he said was, why didn't we blame people or hold them accountable for not seeing it and doing something? I actually think one of the most interesting things, particularly when you get into the interviews with people like Tony Ritter and Jerry Levin, who, who aren't heard from a lot, is they actually saw it and tried to do something about it. So you might try to hold them to task for why didn't they do enough or why didn't what they do work. But I don't think it was a question they didn't see it. So one of the things that or reasons we went with the riptide metaphor was, you know, in the riptide, sometimes the strongest swimmers get taken out to sea and the weakest one can get washed back on shore almost because they just wind up in the right part of the, the current. So our premise was a lot of this was inevitable because of the structure of the industry, particularly because of the the changes in what content became free, like the, the Yahoo Reuters story, or this aspect of there just weren't a lot of engineers and they weren't put in charge. Um, it was very much the question of, you, know, you would have looked back 20 years ago and said, Knight Ritter or Time Warner in its statement, these are sort of permanent businesses. And they got preempted, in the case of, of Knight Ritter, destroyed very, very quickly. And they were strong athletes. And, and in their case, they tried really hard with labs, with prototypes, with the earliest experiments in, te in teletext, video text, proprietary services on AOL and on the web, and it didn't work. So before we get to kind of the diversity concerns about the report, because it was, you know, a largely white male perspective, um, I still want to kind of focus a little bit more on maybe some of the other issues with the, the focus of the report. Um, Andrew, did you want to jump in with some of your thoughts or critiques? Yeah, Paul, I think, you know, overall, I think it's a great first stab at what you have dubbed like the oral history of the collision between journalism and digital technology, although I think there was a slight disconnect between what I was expecting and what I saw there, because your tagline, once you clicked into your piece at the top of the webpage, says, what really happened to the news business? But then the promise of that opening line was really this kind of sweeping view of digital and journalism. So I'm wondering... How, how should we be reading it? Is it really focusing on the news business, or should we hold you to a to, to really looking at the entire breadth of things that that are out there regarding technology and journalism? Um, I would never make the claim. While we certainly want attention and people to read it and comment on it, listen to the interviews, and use it as a resource, particularly as an archive resource for a long time, that in one term we could cover everything. I do think it's what happened to the business of news or the news business and the digital disruption to those business models, why, why some things just didn't work no matter how hard uh, people tried, and I think it sets up some lessons and maybe some direction for the future for people. Um, it's not the story of all journalism. I do think it's the story of what happened to the business of journalism in this disruption. Mm -hmm. it, was Craig Newmark part of your interviewee list or, or not? Um, it's interesting. We did talk to Craig. He didn't mm -hmm. want to be interviewed on camera. Um, and in many ways, I think we were looking at the, and, and we sat in the room with him, he just didn't want to be recorded on the record, That's his, but he's certainly been quoted in lots of other places. So not just video, he didn't even want the audio as well. Nothing. No, he didn't want to be quoted. Um, certainly the impact of Craigslist, and there's a photo of Craig Newmark standing in front of, of their offices in, in one of the chapters, is important. I think one of the other things was maybe more interesting to this specific point of the business. We know what happened to classified ads in newspapers, but we did talk about there was, there has been some success in niche online advertising that newspaper industry started and, and still runs today, career builder, cars, uh, etc. cetera. Um, but it makes the point about analog dollars to digital dimes. Right, so right. it was just a better business in print because frankly it was inefficient and inefficiency usually leads to excess profits. And online, it's just a much, much smaller business. And the challenge is that big, inefficient, profitable business provided a subsidy for newsrooms that isn't there. You know, 90% of it's gone in the dollars to dimes uh, metaphor. Even where, where these news organizations were successful, paid attention, and lost, launched something new that's a good business, but the old business is really hurt in that transition. So Craigslist is certainly an aspect of it. We mention it without talking to him. I think he would say, well, he did say, um, you know, he wasn't paying attention to the news business at all at the time. He has some interest in it now. He's 
spoken on his own for that. I don't want to speak for him. Um, so the impact was very much secondary and completely accidental. Right. And the other question I had was uh, New Century Network. I was really hoping to see that appear somewhere in the pages there because folks remember that time in 1995, this was yep. the traditional newspapers banding together to say the web is scary and weird and technically hard, so we better put all our resources together to make a foil to what Microsoft and all these other folks are doing. Yeah. Um, and I know this from first-hand experience because most of my, not most, a lot of my students that I had at Columbia J School at the time were moonlighting at New Century Network downtown and they would, they would do the overnight and they would show up to class like sleeping practically in my classroom, but they're getting paid 20, 25 bucks an hour to do curation pretty much overnight. Right. So I'm kind of surprised. Did you run into New Century Network at all during your interviews? We, we did, and I guess this is both the strength and the weakness of doing this as a multimedia report. You know, the essay is very long. It's half a book. Um, but we couldn't put everything in there. I think it's the Don Graham interview. He talks about it a fair amount. I think Tony Ritter gets into it. Jerry Levin does not. Um, I can't remember if the Chicago Tribune section mentions it. So it's actually in there, but you have to go back and forth to get there. I think the most interesting point related to that, and I think it was Don Graham's point, was just sort of how dysfunctional this consortia idea was. Right. And the challenge was you had monopolists, not a word he would use, but basically monopoly businesses, geographically secure, agreeing to try to work together. New Century Network is one example of these online uh, advertising businesses were another, and they they would they spend more time in their board meeting arguing about whose turn was it to put somebody in charge. Right. And these were constrained businesses that weren't really allowed to go compete hard against the motherships, if you will. And I think his point was at some point he and and Alan Spoon, I think, and Alan also we interviewed, um, basically decided they needed to stop doing this so much and walk away from them because it wasn't functional and it certainly wasn't competing with the standalone disruptive startup tech businesses that were going after some of these things like local advertising either as display or classified or trying to do content as, as um, New Century Networks was also yeah. trying to do. I, was, I used your search engine so I couldn't find either Century or New Century anywhere in there so I'll look a little deeper but I'd love to also just get all the text of your transcripts and do some interesting so it's, clouds and everything like that. Yeah, it's, it's all there it all should be searchable. It's not coming up. I, I please send me a note because that could be a bug. Uh, right. Frankly, it could be a typo in the transcript since we used an internet service to do those. Although we check them, we spot check them pretty carefully. And if there's a bug, please let me or Josh Benton know at Neiman Labs because um, if that's a technical issue. We certainly want all of the content to be accessible. And one of the reasons we put those the long, long text transcripts up there is that video is so hard to search. This would be a way to go try to find those things. Right. So I want to bring Andrea in as well. Um, you wrote a really interesting story and critique of Riptide talking about, you know, not only the, the lack of kind of gender representation and diversity in the people that were interviewed, but also uh, the fact that they kind of missed the part about, you know, technology and how it democratizes media creation and consuming by a lot of uh, women and people of color that were kind of given a voice that they didn't have in mainstream media. Do you want to talk a little bit about your take, Andrea? Yeah. Uh, well, first, thank you guys so much for having me. And I want to say right off the bat to Paul, who I spoke to a little bit for my critique, that I really do think that Riptide is a very, very impressive collection of journalism. And the interviews are going to be a great resource going forward. But I do think it presents a really sort of narrow perspective on the disruption of the news media business. And I think to a certain extent that may have been because of an inattentional distraction sort of situation. I know that the news media group is very siloed, you know, as a woman working in the news media field. Uh, you can look at statistics that back that up. You know, we're talking about oh, uh, a situation where women are only 36% of newsroom jobs on a very consistent basis over the last 10 years. And I do think that one of the things that technology and the internet in particular have been able to do is allow mar groups that are sort of marginalized by the legacy media uh, companies. In, 
you know, including women, including minorities, to have a different way to create content and reach out to consumers. And I do think that's part of how the business of media was disrupted, although oh, I'm not sure if Paul would necessarily agree. But I am sympathetic to what Paul told me when we discussed it earlier that, you know, regrettably, when they looked through the people that they considered leaders in the industry, they found them to be remarkably white and male. Which I, I, and I think that the Short and Science Center has actually done a really interesting job covering this in previous events that they've done. And it was sort of disappointing to me that they, they didn't take a step back from the report as it came out and see that, oh, we might be missing part of this equation right here. Perhaps we should consider or look, talking to some of the people who have done an interesting things as part of this last transition in uh, digital journalism with the internet. Uh, when I spoke with Paul, I suggested a few places that might have made interesting case studies, like feminist, you know, racialicious, or even the Gawker Media blog Jezebel. And Paul told me that he didn't think those were particularly significant. And I think that speaks a lot to his perspective. Hmm. So maybe I could respond. Yeah. So, uh, I, so first, I did appreciate the conversation before, and I thought you did a very thoughtful piece uh, on the Post site, and I appreciate it. And I, the, the statistics, at least going back 10 years, are, are, are very interesting. Um, I didn't say that I didn't think those sites weren't important or impactful. I think they're on a different story, and it's one that could be told in a continuation of Riptide or elsewhere online, even at Shorenstein, although I certainly don't speak for Shorenstein, and that would be up to uh, Alex Jones and his colleagues to decide. I don't think those are as the explain the business angle that we were taking. And uh, going back to Andrew's point, we didn't try to cover everything in the change in media. We tried to cover a big question, not all of the questions. So I think those sites are interesting. I think the rise of um, many of them we did cover. I do think, and, and I, I'm not criticizing you directly here, but I think that this criticism has chosen to ignore that we actually did speak to some women too, and they speak to exactly these points. One of the criticisms used uh, artwork from our site of the pictures of the speakers and cropped it so not a single woman appears. Well, that's actually also not a fair representation. So some of the people we talked to also were women and they talked to some of these points. So I don't think you can ignore Carolyn Little who now speaks for the whole newspaper industry but ran the Washington Post digital business for a while or Betsy Morgan and not take their opinion as valid and then you can choose to take them as gender specific if you want to or not. So I think you've raised some really good questions. I think they could be added to Riptide in the future, but I don't think they were central to our central question, and I wouldn't want someone to have the impression that I don't think that those sites, or frankly, the addition of so many voices, uh, it didn't happen or it was a bad thing. In fact, I think that's one of the most important things. We, we did a uh, panel at Harvard on Monday when the site launched, and one of the things I said at the end in conclusion is we shouldn't be just nostalgic about the old days of journalism. There were a lot of problems. Um, all along the way, even in any age that would be called the golden age of journalism, wasn't always. And, and it was a business that was way too dominated uh, by certain groups and not pluralistic at all. And, and that's getting better. One of our concerns, though, was, and I, you know, I would say probably none of the sites you listed would see their job, for example, as doing the Watergate investigation. One of the questions would be, which organizations are going to be big enough and strong enough to do those kinds of stories because those would be important, or at the local level, covering the school board and uncovering um, corruption. And those kinds of things were done pretty well by media in the past, and I think our concern was who's going to do those. We didn't address all the positive change, which is, in many ways, the multiculturalism that now flourishes on the webs, in sites, in blogs, on Twitter, in lots of places, or just even the ability to search and find things and not have a newsroom filtering your ability to get to everything that, say, uh, a web search can get for you. I think those are all yeah, positives. But, just don't think they're part of the business story we were trying to tell. Yeah, but if you look at it, who's doing the Watergate now? It's people like Edward Snowden, WikiLeaks. Um, there's a whole bunch of new players. There's ProPublica. There's nonprofit news happening. So there's yep. a lot of other players that have come up that there are, are actually doing even, really interesting work. Even those work. have mostly relied, in, and I know Anne-Marie wants to get in, but let me just say, because I think you pointed it at me, 
most of the outlet for that has been the mainstream media sites, and if they don't have a way to maintain their strength, then it's unclear that that would be distributed. I will say I'm a huge fan of ProPublica, and in full disclosure, I'm a member of the board, so I should say that up front. Um, but it is the single large today national non-for-profit, so as much as I love what we're doing there, and I think that newsroom is just incredibly strong and done great stories, um, it alone is not enough to replace what's been lost so far in investigative journalism and a lot of other other venues. So we're we're still we're not sure. I think that the balance is going to come out where it was or better or worse yet. Okay, Anna, you want to jump in? I know you do. Well, I'm going to echo sort of what Andrew said, um, sort of uh, on the sidelines here, which is I don't know if we should hold Jezebel up to the Watergate standard. There's not a lot of papers in the, in the general that can be held to the Watergate standard, and you know. And I, it's hard for me not to look at this really personally. You know, I kind of lived through this disruption, and I lived through it as a as I don't even call myself a refugee, but like I did not find a home, you know, in mainstream media. I did not find, you know, I did not find myself to be able to succeed, you know, in those institutions. And I was kind of forced, <laughs> you know, into these sidelines or what seemed like sidelines of the past, and kind of just, you know had fun with it, did my best, and I, I've been very lucky to be able to have a career, but, you know, I I just remember my experiences at large organizations and, and at the beginning of the sort of dot-com era, and it's very, it's, again, it's very personal for me, like trying to bring in um, web-centric ideas, trying to begin, even I got the idea of like doing like an, a listserv for people, and being rejected, and it was hard not to see also some of that rejection, to hear like male counterparts make similar, not as good, quite frankly, suggestions and have them been taken more seriously. You know, like I said, so this is like a very deeply, intensely personal story for me. So, you know, I think it's interesting, too, if you look at the Matthew Ingram story, you know, out of the disruptors, it turns out that two of the five women that were talked to were the ones who saw it coming, right? Like, you, you, at least in his article, like, you only talked to five women, and two of those were women that actually saw this happening and wanted to do something about it. Which says to me, there's something, I guess, to Andrew's point, there's something about already being an outsider, you know, for your because of your gender or maybe because of your race or for other reasons, and being able to see this disruption coming and wanting to do something different and not having the mainstream, um, the most mainstream people in the most mainstream institutions able to hear your criticism even, like able to hear what you're saying and bring it and, and, and do something differently. Uh, I, I, that's interesting, and I get that frustration, but I don't think it was just you or just them. Um, you had the leaders of these companies, like a Tony Ritter, even seeing it. It's interesting, you know. He identified it as the biggest risk when he took over the business, um, and he got savaged by his own newsrooms for not saying editorial independence or something was his biggest concern. He said the disruption by electronic advertising was his biggest concern. So he saw it. I, I'm not commenting on whether there were people in his organizations who were that he was sympathetic enough to and heard it, um, but it wasn't just voices lost. Uh, in, a, in a cubby somewhere, um, even when they heard it, they were disrupted. I, I mean, it's, it's, an, it's a long and complicated story. I guess I, I agree more with Andrea than I, I do with your description as far, as far as like what should have been paid attention to. I think there's sort of just... The, the story that gets told when you talk to the people that are thought of as leaders, like I know you're a good journalist, you probably didn't intend to use passive voice there, but um, it, it sort of, you know, just institutionalizes the idea that some people are leaders and considered leaders by some anonymous, you know, it, it just happens that people are leaders. But there's a very distinct kind of way that, you know, institutions and individuals become, uh, don't be, I'm using passive voice myself, but like there's <laughs> a reason why, like, it's mostly guys, you know, <laughs> and mostly white. Yeah, they, they, they were at the time. If you, you can choose any other, I'm sorry about the passive voice, we're both guilty of it and probably had red pens taken to our text many, many times by people like Andrew uh, and others who would be correcting our stuff. Um, but if you go back and just say, who, who had the power to make well, the decision? Who I know was you're the just saying CEO? who had the power, and we interviewed people who had the power, but I think, and maybe this is just a critique of the, direct, of the whole concept, and if what I'm saying, if you had done it differently, it would have been a different project. But to understand what happened, I think you not ha you have to talk to more than just the people who were in power. You have to talk to people who were the threats to the people in power, and you have to talk to the people who did something different, you know, and, and maybe were not able to stay in, to, to become powerful in that particular sort of, you know, place because they were doing things differently. 
I mean, I don't know. Like I said, I think that maybe I take this a little too personally. Um, I have some very obviously clear memories of, of things that have happened, you know, that fr still frustrate me to this day. Um, the last thing I was going to add um, about sort of the problem of uh, who, who gets talked to and who doesn't and who, who are the people that matter, you know, I'm very proud to work at The Guardian until the NSA stuff, until Snowden brought this stuff to, to Glenn Greenwald, I don't think The Guardian, I mean, they had the, they had the um, phone tapping story in England, but it, it wasn't like that they've done, they're, they're not the New York Times, I guess is what I'm trying to say. They're not like an institutional center in, in American um, journalism, and they didn't get the NSA story because of, they didn't get it because of the phone tapping story. They got it because of Glenn Greenwald, who is very much outside sort of the mainstream centers of journalistic power, as it were. I mean, he's, I perhaps am not even sure he would really consider himself a mainstream journalist. I mean, he's, he's a, he's, He's a lawyer. He's a critic. You know, he's done a lot of really good criticism. But he was brought that story because of the way the media landscape is now. He was considered more trustworthy. You know, I mean, I think just the, I don't know. I felt it. I'm now traveling. Yeah. Andrea, did you want to jump in? <laughs> oh, see, there I got my microphone. Uh, I just, I did want to, since Anna Marie brought up The Guardian, actually another comment that I wanted to make was that The Guardian is one of these upcoming news sources that has done a really great job transitioning to the digital era, and they have some really strong female leaders, that, like either currently or in the past, who would have made great additions to the Riptide list. Uh, Emily Bell, uh, who's now, oh, I believe, at the Tau Center. Janine Gibson, who's currently the head of uh, Editor-in-Chief of The Guardian U.S. Either one of those people would have made really phenomenal additions who could have brought it in a different perspective to how the journalism... Um, so so I don't, I don't disagree, it. and I don't want to get into a name-by-name name because I don't think in the end that's fair to them. But again, I think it's unfair to discount, since you've named a very specific organization, and we interviewed Carolyn Little, and not because she was a woman, but one of the things she did was run The Guardian's efforts. So... You could say maybe we didn't cover that enough, but it's actually in there, and it's actually in there in the voice of a woman who was there and ran it. So I'd love for there to be more interviews. I, you, you don't want to hear me complain about how much work we did in, in 90 days because you don't think we did enough, but getting 61 done was a lot. But we said from the start, and so is Shorenstein, there will be more, and we set it up so there can be. So I don't think this group should go through and sit, vote thumbs up or down on any one suggestion. In the end, that would be... Shorenstein and the next people who actually have to go do the work. But I think we can add them, but I don't think they're all simply missing and all silent and that we certainly didn't purposely try to ignore those areas or those voices. And we'd invite people to do it. Now, you really have to sign up for the time to do it. It doesn't happen easily, and Shorenstein is, is prepared to make the commitment to do it. In fact, when we said if we do it as a website, you guys have to support it because we're leaving campus. You guys have to figure out how to make this live and go on and then add to it and they would like to but we need to do it it has to be done as an organized effort it can't be done ad hoc and so someone needs to raise their hand and say I want to come and be a fellow or I want to come and do that work there it's easy to say go do it I can tell you having done it, it takes a lot of time to get it done and, and Shorenstein is willing to do it but someone's gonna have to go help absolutely Andrew, well, oh. go ahead Andrea uh, thanks sorry about that uh, and just Real quickly here, Paul, once again, as I said at the beginning, I think it's a really impressive piece of journalism. I think the, the, the interviews are a fabulous resource, and I, I really applaud you for, for going through and getting the interviews. And I, I really do hope that the project is expanded upon and gets to include some of these other perspectives. Yeah, and Andrew, you wanted to jump in with some other things you thought it could have covered as well. Yeah, I mean... Yeah, I mean, the question I had before was a foreshadowing to what I wanted to talk about now, which is, was this piece really focused on the business and the profits and the revenues and the people in power determining, you know, how those things would be solved going forward? Or was this really talking about, you know, the journalism and the content and the digital culture that evolved over time? Um, I'm still not clear on that, and maybe part of the beauty is going forward, we will have a collaborative process where we bring more people in, more interviews in to fill out that whole body of work. But the thing that did disturb me because of the selection or the, the gallery of folks who did the interviews is that I would like to see, even if Craig Newmark was not willing to go on camera or on the record, more people, as Anna said, were part of the disruption, who were creating a new net culture, 
creating a whole new set of content models that were certainly, if not usurping the big media folks, nipping at their heels and, and devolving everything. So I'd like to see more folks for which you know, Reddit, Buzz, BuzzFeed, Slashdot, Wikipedia are all like really cool, logical extensions of this net culture that evolved in the 90s and not um, seen as weird uh, things that landed from Mars, which I think most of the folks you interviewed in Riptide would see these as just things that they don't understand. But to get more at the folks who were actually at the bottom of the uh, uh, at the bottom of the tree, you know, nipping at the heels, and to see those stories, I'd be more interested in those, and I'd be happy to volunteer my class or my students to try to get more of those types of interviews to fill in those gaps. Well, they did have Jonah Peretti now, for, who is the founder of BuzzFeed. He was part of it, so they did yeah, have but some, but I didn't think it was quite. I, yeah, I think I agree. I think that was my biggest one of my big critiques was that too that. I'm not quite as interested to hear about how everyone failed as much as how are people succeeding. I would have loved to hear 61 interviews with the people who are actually doing really well and doing exciting, innovative things. Well, I think I think people like Dick, or if you go back to, to Dave Weiner or Doc Searles, there are people who are really early disruptors. Um, their voices are there. There's just room for more of them and more of those stories. So I, I guess I would say to Andrew, I think some of it's there. I don't think we chose to ignore it. I think all of these are areas that can be expanded upon, and I hope people will, whether that's literally signing up and saying, how do we contribute to simply going on and adding to the discussion that's there, because it's all there unedited, from the interviews and the transcripts to an ability for people to post anything, as long as it's relevant and not obscene, as a suggestion. And you know, there are threads that have been started. Some I think are relevant. Some I think people have taken in some pretty wild tangents, but that is the web. Um, yeah, and people are free to read, comment, or pass on any part of it they want to. So they've disrupted your report on disrupting. <laughs> no, they've added to it. They, 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 today, at least, they don't have access to the homepage, so we at least get to, to put, we do the first pointer, but after then, you lose control. I was just going to say, like, the very way that you've done this, like, wouldn't, the, the people that I worked with, you know, 15 years ago, like, wouldn't have approved. You know, like you know, maybe that's good. Maybe that's we're being a little disruptive. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's work. We won. Hi. You well, know, I, I can tell you, we've been hearing from many of them, and the one thing they do is they go first to their page and they send us all corrections. <laughs> Paul, what is several the, people have asked us to change their picture, and a couple of people have found some good typos. So it's a it's a interesting mixed bag of Paul, feedback. Wh What's the copyright status of the videos and interviews? Is it Creative Commons, or have you not Yeah, it's under Creative Commons under version 3, I guess it is. Great. That's great. So we, we chose neither a subscription or an ad model. Great. So I do want to talk quickly about the kind of programmer stuff that's going on, because not only is the media world have some issues with kind of diversity and voices being brought in, but also the technology world. Um, we had uh, the Business Insider CTO, Pax Dickinson, um, and his Twitter feed, Game Delight, um, due to Valleywag and some other people kind of digging through and finding some pretty bad stuff. He was fired from his position, and now he's launching a new startup around kind of encrypted uh, social networks. Um, and also at TechCrunch Disrupt, one of the bigger technology um, industry, uh, they had a hackathon where... Um, these guys got up and made this kind of joke app called Titstare that, you know, while everyone was completely outside the room, was really upset with it, inside the room there was a lot of applause and laughter and people loved it. Um, what is the situation now? I mean, this feels like something that, this is kind of like we've all seen this movie before, um, people just being completely insensitive and kind of the same power structure in technology as there is in media. Um, Anna, what was your take on all everything that's happened lately? Well, to be honest, I felt a little bit like a bad, you know, member of the, you know, media technology community because I had no idea what a dick this guy was. Like, I, <laughs> a past Dickinson, I mean, like, I, you know, saw the story about what had happened most recently, and then, you know, people were posting stuff that had been on its timeline for just, you know, years. And, wow. Um, I, I'm, I, I don't even know where to go. I mean, I think that, um, uh, Rachel Sklar did a really good piece sort of connecting um, Titstare and Pax and then Riptide and talking about how, you know, these things happen. You, you know, diversity, we, we can talk about diversity just as in general being a nice thing because everyone likes diversity, but what happens is when you have a monoculture, things 
slide by and don't get noticed, right? Like you, you, you develop problems that be in the modern culture no one sees as problems. And, and that's obviously, well, to me, like that seems what's happened here, right? Like, because if you have a culture that's mainly bros, then, you know, you have like things that may start out small and then become more outrageous and then the outside community, to, you know, observe them. I mean, again, and then part of me is like, well, this is nothing new. You know, I mean, I think that, the, that what happened here is, again, in a monoculture, things that would have gotten slapped down maybe a little bit earlier did not. And so it just got to be very embarrassing. I think it, for, I think it's great that they have, that we have the ability to still be ashamed by these things, or somebody has the ability to be ashamed by these things. Um, as a woman, um, you know, who sees some of this stuff, you know, I, I get outraged and, um, you know, and then there's a part of me that if I spent every day calling out all the different problems I see, like, I just wouldn't have time to write about much else, you know? I mean, I don't know how Andrea feels about it, but um, there comes a point where you can't make it your full-time job to be, like, the professional, you know, keeper of, of uh, a, I, I don't know, equal uh, treatment. I mean, I, I guess that's what we technically do have people set up in government offices to do that, but... Um, to a certain extent, I let it slide by too in my life because it, it just gets to be exhausting and, quite frankly, not very fun. It's more fun to laugh at, at people looking at tits than it is to be the one to be offended by it, you know. Um, and I think even in some of the stories you see about Pax Dickinson, you, you see some women talking about how there's, uh, I guess, the woman that he started this um, glimpse with, like she said she used to be a professional defender of like tex te sexism in tech. And I think that, the, that sometimes if you choose a career that's dominated by men, you wind up making excuses. Um, and I, I guess maybe it's just for rock, rock me back a little bit, and maybe I'll stop making or stop ignoring or stop making excuses. But I am really interested in what Andrea has to say. Can, yeah. So, you know, looking at te uh, TechCrunch Disrupt, I was just not surprised at all about the Titstare app, and I think that's because I'm sort of inundated with that kind of stuff constantly. And I do think that it has something, as Anna Marie said, with how consistently e monoculture or in white males that a lot of the tech industry is. And it's not because women lack an aptitude for tech stuff. And I mean, there was a nine year old girl who also presented an app at TechCrunch Disrupt, which I think sort of shows you that. But it, behavior like Pax Dickinson's is one of the things that basically exiles women from the space in a way that's really counterproductive, that stops it from the tech industry from being as successful as it really can be. You know, and as a woman who spins day in and day out in this thing, I can tell you it's really, really difficult to deal with some of the feedback that I get. Um, actually, I can tell you a story. Uh, Earlier this week, I got a uh, email reader feedback suggesting that I regularly engage in fellatio on one of my new sources. I can guarantee you that my male tech colleagues at the switch at the post would not have received that email. That's pretty, they're, it's really bad. It's just that yeah. like, like, men don't get this, like, men get criticized. I think sometimes I know, like, the knee jerk response to what Andrew's saying. We're like, oh, men get criticized too, and we have sexual, you know, sexually derogatory things said to us. But, like, it's just the volume and the violence of it, I would say, is what's different for women. And the implicit threat of it too. Because I'm sorry, like, if you are a woman, there is a threat implied when someone makes, when someone talks about something sexually violent to you, there is an implicit threat to it. And it's, you know, I mean, again, and I feel like I feel that there's, there's, it's, I think it says something that I feel kind of like I have to apologize for even making that point, you know, um, and yeah, <laughs> I, I'm glad I work at home, I'm glad that I don't have to like, you know, I, I deal with a great editor, I don't have to respond to reader mail, um, but yeah, all of this has brought back some like really intense, um, you know, like this stuff, yeah, this stuff is not new, it's not new at all. Yeah. And Andrew, you wanted to, to jump in a little bit about kind of the defense that we've been hearing about um, Pax Dickinson and also maybe talk about some solutions or things that might change the ratio as Rachel Scar, her group, is called. Yeah, I, I think, you know, some folks have, I wouldn't quite say jump to Dickinson's defense, but trying to explain him 
mansplain to, to some folks, but it just didn't work. I mean, trying to portray this as kind of, oh, he's just like that, performance art, and he's kind of over the top, uh, I don't think it resonates with anyone at this point, uh, although they were very uh, crafty in trying to explain it that way. I mean, one of the interesting things here is that there's a piece in Business Insider that came out this week as well, which really... I thought was a really nice piece that basically said, you know, here's seven ways that tech companies deter females from joining them. And even just innocent terms that we think are innocent, like, are you a code ninja? Are you a hacker? We want you to come join us. But those words are very much loaded towards finding male applicants, right? They actually very much alienate females. Like, female? I'm not, I would never consider myself a ninja. I'm a female, so I guess they don't want me, right? So even just changing the language there a little bit helps out a lot. Um, even academic postings, one of the ones that was here at American U said, are you a game changer? Um, a lot of women may not think of themselves as a game changer. I don't play games, I'm not a football player, I don't do game changing. So these things we really have to be much more aware of. And I think you know, the Maynard Institute has you know, fault lines training for journalists and everything. I think this is something that for the tech world would really be a great thing. And you know, finally, the one area where I really deep dive into is Wikipedia editing and it's been a real problem for over a decade that over 90 percent of the editors in Wikipedia are male. I mean we're not even talking like 70, 30, 80, we're talking like 91, 9 uh, male and that's a real problem and this is something that's really hard to turn around. There is now this gender gap research being done in the Wikimedia Foundation about this. But the stories, because I've been to all the conferences and helped organize them, the stories from female participants at wiki conferences sometimes are very disturbing in terms of groping and, and getting strange stares and, and real creepy interactions with uh, not just, not all Wikipedia editors obviously, but a certain type of tech crowd um, explains a lot of why you know, females don't feel like they're safe or even welcome in these type of environments. So we really have to work harder in trying to figure this out because I think it's, it's a real long-term problem. Yeah, Anna, do you want to talk about any solutions that you see as something that can help uh, outside of just speaking out? I mean, I know people who are hiring and people who are setting up conferences can make a lot more efforts when it comes to having a more diverse you know, group of speakers or group of people that they're hiring. Is that for me or Andrew? Oh, for you, Anna. Oh, um, yeah, I, I do think that, that, you know, I mean, I don't have any uh, genius solutions that haven't been, you know, I mean, I think that this, the good solutions are the simple ones, which are, like, just make, if you make women more visible, you will make them more normalized. If you treat women with respect on an everyday way, you will, you will engender respect outward. You know, I mean, I think that a lot of people are doing good stuff. I mean, like I was actually saying, I think that, I wish I had more hard data. I wish I just knew more about what kind of science and technology education was happening at a younger level. I think that technology itself, in some ways to me, technology is becoming less gendered. Like the way we use technology today, like women have, a, it feels very equal to me. Like computers are not scary, big, dark things. And, and um, women play with technology. I mean, the gaming specifically, maybe not as much. but. Um, you know, I have hope this will change. I think the thing that keeps it from changing um, is st is when the current culture becomes just so offensive <laughs> um, and, and so threatening. I mean, I, I, and it's threatening is the word I keep coming back to because it, it's not just about like am I like some of what Andrew was saying kind of rubbed me a little the wrong way because like when I look at you know I can I consider myself a ninja I guess you know. Um, but uh, and it's not that so much it's a problem, it's like whether I feel safe, you know, going and being a ninja with other people. Like it's whether or not I feel like I will be treated okay if I try to do this hard stuff. It's not that I'm afraid to do hard stuff, it's not that I don't think of myself as a game changer, it's if I go into a community and I try to act like a game changer, will I be, how will I be treated? I mean, I think that's the problem. I don't think women are afraid of being disruptors or afraid. Come, I think we're naturally disruptors in a certain sense. Um, I think it's that what what is the what are the obstacles we face towards getting our voice heard? Because you know, my again, I, I would love the other woman on this panel to say something say say something to this if she wants to. Which is that you know, for me, the problem has not been that I don't want to speak out. It is that when I speak out, what the reactions are, um, and there there have you know there are gendered reactions to it and. I mean, I, I, I think things are changing. Um, 
I hope things are changing. I think the only way it changes is if you, is to do the, self, the small, simple stuff. Make women more visible. When they're visible, treat them with respect. Andrew, did you want to jump in? Uh, yeah, actually, real quick, I wanted to jump in about oh, to statistics on women gamers. We're actually fairly big. Uh, the most recent annual studies show that women purchase 50% of the video games in the U.S., which, you know, is pretty significant. It makes us roughly half of the market. Uh, but that video games routinely don't feature female protagonists, and that when they do, they're not given the same type of marketing uh, budget as games that feature male protagonists. So there it seems a lot more like perhaps an industry problem than there not being an audience for it. Uh, but I, I really do agree with a lot of things that Anna Marie is saying. It's, I write about gender and tech on a semi-regular basis, and I can tell you that a lot of the time, the things that I say, it feels like they're dismissed because they're coming from a woman. Mark, Mark I'm not hearing you now. Sorry about that. Mm -hmm. There you go. I just want to. <laughs> I wanted to wrap up in a very silent, muted way. <laughs> um, but I want to thank everyone for joining us for the podcast. Um, if anyone's going to the ONA conference, um, October 16th, we'll be having a collaborative workshop uh, with a diverse group of people talking about uh, media innovation. Um, in Atlanta on October 16th. You can learn more at bit.ly slash collab ATL um, to come to our workshop. I want to thank uh, Anna Marie Cox from The Guardian for joining us, as well as Andrea Peterson from The Washington Post, Andrew Lee from American University, Paul Sagan from the Shorenstein Center. Um, and join us each and every week here Fridays uh, on Media Twits. 1.30 p.m. Eastern Time. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.